Hello Campus. Heidi, hi. Don't tell him, Pike. Pike. <laughs> I met him, and he frightened me to death. I'm free! <laughs> he ruled with a rod of iron. Did he? A rod of iron yeah. and a smile on his face. Like a smiling viper. Good morning. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> and he would laugh on every run-through, right up to the day of transmission, he would still laugh. I remember someone saying to me, do you know what, I walked down my road and I could hear laughter in the street. David Croft, the man who wrote some of our best-loved TV comedies, has died at the age of 89. David Croft was a unique talent in the world of British comedy, not only co-writing, but producing and directing many of the greatest comedy series of the 20th century. This is my wife, Edith. I have told her everything. Will she talk? Incessantly. <laughs> David Croft is a brand, you know, a Croft programme is a real quality brand. And you just guarantee if David Croft was producing, it was always going to be brilliant. David Croft sitcoms were you know, a key part of my growing up. Looking back, it must have been so nice for my parents to have us all in the same room, probably crying with laughter, no doubt. David knew the business inside and out. Loved actors. Actors loved him. He was like a conductor. He conducted the whole thing. Uh, without him, nothing really would have happened. For the first time, we'll hear the audio tapes he made whilst working on the scripts. Ted joins Gladys. Head into microphone. Hello, campers. Welcome to Maplin's. Heidi, hi. David Croft was born in 1922 into a show business family. He inherited a love of entertainment from his parents, who performed together in the theatre. He literally was a sort of dressing room baby. Made his first appearance at the age of three, and from the moment he walked off, he said he was totally hooked. His mother was an amazing character and very talented. She was the only woman ever that had a theatrical production company in the West End without a male partner or male equivalent. It was Anne Croft Presents. His father, Reginald Charland, was an actor and writer who moved to Hollywood to pursue his career. David Croft followed the family tradition and entered the world of entertainment. His path soon crossed with a man who would become a lifelong colleague and friend. When I first met David Croft, I was a ragged ass actor, and his wife phoned me up, who was my agent. She said, oh, Jimmy, David's doing a new situation comedy called Bigger My Neighbour. You're always so honest and trustworthy. Never nick no more than what you could carry under your coat. <laughs> I did this scene where I came, hello, hello, Sid, it's me, your, your brother George. Here! What are you all ponced up for? Got a job as a waiter or something? <laughs> Growing tired of small acting roles, Perry decided to try his hand at writing. I, thought, I know what I'll do. I'll write a pilot. One day he, he came in and he said to me, uh, I've got a script, you know, I really would... I think it's got something. So I read it and I thought, well, I, yes, it has. Anne said to me, show it to David. He said, Jimmy, it's great. Let's do it. Who do you think you are kidding, Mr. Hitler, if you think we're on the run? None of us thought it was going to become a national treasure. It was just another comedy series. Right, right Pike, take off your tunic and wrap it on the pipe. Why me? Because you're wet already. Oh, I'm <laughs> the magic ingredient was their casting. Mm. It's doomed, doomed. I mean, the casting was absolutely brilliant. I mean, all of his shows. You know perfectly well that you can work here all day while I'm busy at the bank. I'm sorry, Captain Mannering, but nothing is going to make me get up out of this chair, and that is that. <laughs> David Croft used to, to cast people really well, in that you, can't, you couldn't imagine anybody but the people that played all of those parts from all of those series playing it. <laughs> The thing about Dad's Army is that I think it's probably the most perfect example 
of writing and casting uh, coming together. Come on, Godfrey! Godfrey, pick them up, pick them up! I'm afraid they won't go any higher. Although it's quite a big gallery of characters, every single one of those characterizations is pitch perfect. You'd sell your own grandmother, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, there's no market for her. <laughs> if you were to think, oh, I'm going to start casting those characters, you, you wouldn't want to swap them with anybody. Uh, eight against one. No, it's only seven. I'm not feeling very well. <laughs> We're talking about seven tough old pros. All of them had been there and not quite made it. And suddenly, they're stars. They've made it every time they stop in the street. There he is. And we're all working actors. Old John Laurie, and he was a marvellous actor. And, and Ian Lavender is another wonderful actor. He was quite a young chap when we first started, Ian Lavender. To say they took me under their wings, collectively or even individually, not quite so. I was, it was a bit of sink or swim. I remember David saying, we just thought we'd throw you in the deep end and see what happened. And he said, Frank, you floated, it's all right. Shut the door, back. Yes, sir. From the other side. <laughs> For the sake, get out. <laughs> And Croft had his own unique way of selecting the cast. He said, I just want somebody who, who can shout and push other actors about a bit. What's going on there? I've never heard such a row. His wife, my agent, said, um, well, I've got somebody who, in fact, um, is, is not an actor. I'm not sure that he ever will be a great actor, but I think he's maybe what you want. Hey, hey, if you think I'm hanging on here, you're mistaken. The first series, uh, we wrote more or less together, and then he'd got me to write some, and he wrote some, and a bit of a mess, actually, you can tell us all. So if we finally got to a situation, I said, Dave, there's only one way to do this, face to face. So we both wrote by hand with a lovely felt tip pen, and then we'd have the rough script, and then we'd sit there, and then we'd act it. They showed it, um to an audience, as they always did to tell test it, and it didn't go down very well. And some of the reports, because he used to write a report and come in, they came in. But as David ran his own little sort of empire, in a way, when all the really bad reports came in, the same comedy could be made out of this, he managed to sort of keep them in files that didn't get too high up the <laughs> stand. Is there only one thing to do with this? He, I don't, know, I don't want that one. He said, I knew that given half a chance, it would succeed. All local defence volunteers to report to the church hall at six o'clock today. <coughs> After the first series, Croft and Perry had to defend Dad's army against those who said a comedy should not be made about Britain's home guard. Did the scriptwriters make such a serious national crisis too funny to be even vaguely true. Uh, well, we've, uh, we've had one or two ideas uh, which we thought were too way out. You see, when we started this thing, I think we, we just regarded it as a comedy show. But as you get into it, as soon as we started writing it properly, we realised it was much more than this. Um, because there's a wonderful spirit um, in, in those days. These, these men really would have, they would have died. Um, and as, as soon as you get into that sort of dimension, you, then you can't go too far uh, into the realms of comedy. You've got to keep it sort of its feet on the ground. This sympathetic and understated approach could be seen throughout Croft's work. He was quite a shy man, and he wasn't one, I think, for being openly effusive. That's left to Jimmy Perry, basically. I think that's probably why they were such a good team. He was a very private man, but he was a very caring and loving man. Um, he, he cared deeply about what he did. I never saw him once lose his temper. He was always very calm. He was an observer. He would sit at dinner parties. When he did come out with a line, it was often very witty and very funny and very pertinent. But mostly he watched people. I look at it this way, sir. Now, although Sergeant Wilson has got three stripes on his honourable arm, you've got three pips on your common shoulder. 
to me, uh, the, their uh, series were, were always about class. Class and snobbery. Yes, the, the conflict. Yes, that's where it springs from. That's, they found that. I mean, you see it all the way through. Reminds me of the time when I was at school and we used to have midnight feasts in the dorm. Really? <laughs> <laughs> school I went to, we didn't have any midnight feasts. We had to manage with a few aniseed balls in a corner of the playground. <laughs> Status within their series was, was a really key thing. I mean, in Dad's Army, it was that you had a bank manager and his assistant who were in charge. And there was a kind of issue there because the assistant was, you know, came from a higher class. And you even think you can roll in here 20 minutes late after lunch? Where have you been? Well, I went up to the golf club and had a bite to eat up there. The golf club? Yes. Who took you? Well, I'm a member. <laughs> I've been trying for years to get in there. I believe they're awfully particular. <laughs> I don't think um, when they wrote it, Jimmy Perry and David Croft passed any judgments on anybody. They just laid out what I think was a very accurate landscape of, of uh, how the class system works. I don't start any of that public school cheating with me. <laughs> One of the things that that he did really well is um, the ability to use understatement where a little goes a very long way. <laughs> he was a marvellous director and producer. He was really first class. He'd say, when you do that, just give a pause there and you'll get a bigger laugh. He was right. There we go. No, 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 no. Oh, no, that's only cardboard. (laughs) 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 There there is a war on, you know. He would just smile and nod his head, and you knew that he was pleased, and if he was pleased, you know you'd achieved something. You always try and say, David, I've got an idea, I've got a suggestion here. He'd say, he'd say yeah, yeah. I said, can I just try something? <clears throat> and he'd say, yeah, of course, Melvin, show me, show me. And I would do it. And he'd say, <laughs> that's very funny. I like it. Save it for pantomime. You try something in rehearsals um, and flick a look to David, just see what his reaction is. And just go... Or... And that was it. I was just going to give the order. I was just going to... What's the matter, Corporal? I think I'm going, sir. <laughs> I hear angels' voices. Those are not angels' voices, it's a choir in the office. The most interesting thing about David and Jimmy's writing was the juxtaposition of... Comedy with tragedy. Elizabeth? <laughs> Take a long time to answer, dear. Where have you been? <laughs> Boy singing. <laughs> She's been down in the air raid shelter. Oh. <laughs> I might have a little surprise for you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've got... I've got... <laughs> this Jimmy David had the knack of... How should I put it? Um, using... Broad strokes, poster paints, are they coming very delicate? Pastels, as it were. I, I, I don't want you to go. The whole pattern of my life has changed. I just live from one meeting to the next. I know. And I'm just the same, but it's the only thing to do. People are talking. And people always talk. Who cares about them? But there's your wife. <laughs> Nobody will talk to her. <laughs> it managed to, um, you know, it'd be quite silly... Um, very funny, very nuanced uh, in some of the characterizations, um, but also rather, well, the word I want to use is beautiful, which is that, um, you know, th- they could sometimes achieve levels of poignancy and drama within an episode. Don't get that train. George, I must. I implore you, don't get that train. Look, we'll meet once a week. George, you're making this very difficult for me, but I've made up my mind. It's the only way. Victoria! Victoria! There's my train. Look, Fiona, I've never begged anything from anybody in my life, but I'm begging you not to go. You get this terribly touching, poignant window into 
the unhappiness of Mannering's marriage, really. Um, and he knows that, that nothing can happen, and it, it's, it's all beautifully executed. Where can I get in touch with you? You won't be able to. Well, you're right, won't you? I don't know. Uh, After a little while, uh, Stand clear, sir. And pull those blinds down. I promise you'll promise you're right. Very well. I promise. Make it sure. Goodbye, George. All good comedy is truthful. No matter how silly it is, uh, or apparently silly, it's trying to get at some universal truth, and that's why, when it's good, it has so much power. They'll stick together, you can rely on that. Anybody who tries to take our homes or our freedom away from us, they'll find out what we can do. We'll fight. You could sense it was the, the, the writers nodding their acknowledgement towards the fact that the whole, the whole thing had been triggered by by the experiences of real men in the war, and I thought that was really effective. To Britain's home guard. To Britain's home guard. It's quality stuff, it's timeless stuff. <laughs> Stupid boy. <laughs> Don't panic! Don't panic! <laughs> the fact that Dad's army is, that the millions still watch it, says something. I am an officer. Yes, right. Yes. You're supposed to be an NCO. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. Right. Right. Very right, well. Right. Remember. <laughs> Every Saturday it's on. I'll be in later in the week. <laughs> <laughs> My grandchildren, they love it. Even when I'm not in it. <laughs> and it was real life again that inspired Croft's first hit series with writing partner Jeremy Lloyd. the idea for Are You In Surf, because I'd slaved away for three years in The Simpsons in Piccadilly, which was a big gentleman's outfit. The people, actually, that we created in Are You Being Served were all p types of people I'd worked with. Oh, that dust suit. <laughs> oh, that dust suit. <laughs> oh, that dust suit. <laughs> we had a chat, we had lunch. I'd already written four or five pages. Uh, which he read and said, well, let's do it. And Lucas, while you're down there, straighten those seams. I hate to see crooked seams. Yes, Mr. Peacock. Hmm? Uh, Captain Peacock. <laughs> David actually had a marvellous idea, which I hadn't had, which the uh, ladies and gentlemen's department should be put together so there'd be a lot of conflict. And that was the actual nub of the show, and it, it worked marvellously, and the pecking order worked marvellously. I have been deeply distressed to learn of the slump in our sales over the past four weeks, which I'm sure you've all observed. Hmm? Yes, I have observed it. Haven't you, Mr Granger? Oh, a very definite slump, I would say. Had you observed it, Mr Humpty? Oh, I've observed it, Mr Granger. You observed it too, didn't you? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> In order to do situation comedy, or perhaps almost any comedy, you need to have a situation in which there are rules. Mr. Granger, return from lunch, 14.03. Would you sign, please? I'm sorry, Captain Peacock, but I must refuse to sign your book. And these rules then are in danger of being broken. And from that arises most of the comedy. That's a brandy for Mr. Granger. Well <laughs> done, Mr. Granger, the way you stood up to him. Oh, we shall always remember you for that, Mr. Granger, when you've gone. <laughs> the double entendres, the double meanings, were an essential part of it. And I mean, sometimes they were so outrageous that when we did the read-through, we'd say, we can't say that, we'll all be arrested, you know. It's seven o'clock tonight. My pussy's expecting to see a friendly face. I personally think that Mrs. Slocum's pussy is the funniest joke ever written in any medium, and I can watch it any number of times and never be bored and never stop laughing. I never have any trouble in getting up in the morning. My pussy's just like an alarm clock. <laughs> David would say, look, you do it as though you haven't the slightest idea 
that there is any double meaning at all. So it's done completely innocently and no one will mind. I think looking back now, did my parent, were my parents thinking, oh, some of those innuendos, are they getting them? You know, <laughs> there must be a bit of that. I certainly didn't get any of them, I don't think. Trousers are, to, are at a complete standstill. <laughs> You're lucky to get your tape up once a day. <laughs> it was how you deciphered it. If you thought it was rude, that was you. Or it could have been totally innocent. Whatever has happened to the central heating in here, my ballpoint will never function in this weather. The key in the writing was that they can't get out of their scenario. It's very limiting, but it means you've got to really focus on the jokes. You've got to focus on getting laughs, because there's not much else you can do with it. Mm. She's a healthy girl, isn't she? <laughs> Miss Bronze, get out the 44s. <laughs> The Kilimanjaro range. You know, my favourite character uh, in that was always um, young Mr Grace. You've all done very well. Yeah. <laughs> I just never, never tired of that. And again, you know, you're all doing very well. Uh, just became a phrase that we used uh, whenever it was prompted. Uh, you've all done very well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Grace. There isn't hardly ever a time, somebody did some research on this actually, when an episode of Are You Being Served isn't being shown on some station somewhere. Ho, 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 little boy. Have I got a surprise for you. <laughs> some company sent us in a book which was a quiz on Are You Being Served. Penny, was my daughter, was saying, Oh, Dad, what was Mrs. So-and-so's maiden name before she got married? Uh, um, can't remember at the moment, he said. And they couldn't answer half the questions. <laughs> they came out <laughs> and said, my goodness, people do really listen. And I said, well, you've always said that. <laughs> It ain't half hot mum in two minutes, starting now. Which character uses the expression it ain't half hot mum when writing home during the first episode? I'm gonna park in. Correct. In the seventh series, Captain Ashwood's given an experimental anti malaria drug by mistake. What effect does it have on him? His skull grows through his hair. Yeah, loses his hair. When Bombardier Beaumont kicks the Sergeant Major, what punishment does he receive from the Colonel? He can't play Ginger Rogers again. No, he can't. You enjoying your tea, Gunner? Yes, I What the hell's going on? <laughs> Anybody says to me, what's your favourite? Without a doubt, it's Ain't Our Fault, Mum. Meet the gang, cause the boys are here. The boys to entertain you. Jimmy actually ran a, a concert party. We left India just a few days before India got its independence. Because that's why I've got all these stories. <laughs> David spent most of the war with not doing anything very theatrical, although he was involved with a concert party when he was in India. They always wrote from their own experiences, basically. They took reality and stretched it. The plane will be back for us just before 1800 hours, so Bombardier do not make it a long show. You can rely on me, Sergeant Major. The only thing I can rely on you for, Bombardier, is to ponce about. It ain't half up, Mum. I mean, was a concert party um, out in the jungle, right, playing to nobody, maybe two or three people, two officers who think they were wonderful, wonderful artists, mm -hmm. a sergeant major who just wants to get these men, as men, up there fighting. Leave yourself alone, Bombardier, or I will make you wear boxing gloves. <laughs> <laughs> Pay attention, lovely boys. This is the oddest time of the year. <laughs> we... He's not going to give in. We! He's going to fight it. It's really very, very, very difficult to write big ensemble comedy. Uh, you know, to keep uh, each character's plate spinning on a stick. You a university education won't do you much good up there, will it? No, Sergeant Major. No, Sergeant Major. <laughs> The intellect that is able to cope with all those different people, you know, perhaps as many as 15 people in the cast, and still keep all the threads going and, and keep true to all the characters is extraordinary. I'm afraid there's nothing else for it. Things are getting very desperate. We'll have to break into the cocktail snacks. 
Surely not the same. Yes, I'm afraid, sir. It's very good at creating brilliant characters and then all you have to do is stick different ones in the room and they, and they kind of talk to themselves, in a way, in the writer's mind. Cooey! <laughs> I think he heard me. He's got them all together there so you can bounce off each other. And the group comedy it works, it works marvellously well and they were masters at it. Sir? Guess what the thermometer's reading? Something light. Agatha Christie? <laughs> David had the ability to uh, gather a group of characters together who wouldn't normally want to be in the same room with each other and from that create this marvellous comedy. Let me go out there and win them with my personality. I think a lot of David's comedy was, was very broad and, um, you know, you might say silly, you know, farcical, uh, ludicrous in some ways, like sort of out of the dressing up box. Gloria, bless him. I mean, you know, as far as he's concerned, I mean, life is wonderful, life is show business. I'm meant to be a girl in an English guard. Not Tarzan in the jungle! <laughs> After about four weeks, David said to me, we're going to find it very difficult to, to write for you. And I said, why's that? He said, you're playing it very effeminately. He said, very camp. He said, I said, just a minute, David. I said, Gloria. I said, it's a feminine name. I said, where's a, a wig? Lots of makeup and dresses. How else can I play it? And he went, Yeah, I see what you mean. Mm, mm, mm. You yeah, will carry on then. <laughs> Listen to that. They're shouting, We want Gloria. <laughs> My public are clamouring for me. David used to say to the makeup artist, Let the boys do their own camp makeups. So you've got these lads, Chris, bless them, and Michael, all the lads, and they'd put these terrible makeups on the big lipstick there, you see. But they're caresses. That's how soldiers would have done it. Shut up! This is all your fault, Dennis Hogan! Shut up! I wrote the part of Sergeant Major Williams as a standard Cockney Sergeant Major. We would have right, live right, but we were wrong. Windsor came in to read the part, and he's Welsh. And he read it in Cockney. I said, that's wrong. Would you read it in Welsh? And he read it in Welsh, and that's where the, the whole thing started. He played it for reality. Finish my I loved working with Windsor. I loved working. He was a warm, generous man, you know. So concentrated, you know, he'd be the sergeant major all the time on the set. Right, Johnny? In a row, Johnny! Me want deck or record, chitties. Sergeant Major William Sive, going to park inside. Who do you damn well think you're talking to? <laughs> Actum Jolly! Why don't you talk to me in English, in which I matriculate? Otherwise, I would not be able to hold up this occupation. I am grade two clerk, not some damn native. <laughs> The faces he pulled when he was angry or when he was happy or, or yeah, he was just amazingly good. Acha, ek pyaala garam chaat jaldi banao saath mein jaise saab ke liye. Chhupa tarangi, one cup of heavenly enchanted tea coming up. Saath mein jaise saab. In a minute, my lovely. <laughs> The decision to cast a white actor, Michael Bates, in the part of the bearer would lead to the series running into controversy. Somebody said it was racist, and one of the reasons it was racist was because Michael Bates was white and was playing an Indian character. <laughs> Michael spoke fluent Urdu and was educated in India till he was 16. Knowing David and Jimmy the way I do, I don't think they would do anything that was racist. A lot of David's work is, is, is of its time and, um, and the attitudes of its time. I had too much puggle pani last night. Oh, I've got such terrible pullover. <laughs> I think the notion of it, of it Enough Hotman being uh, politically incorrect is definitely a retrospective 
uh, notion. Sergeant Major Saab Swami to complete secrecy, so I will tell only you. <laughs> we did watch it as a family and, uh, and really enjoyed it. I don't want this fellow to hear because he is nosy parker. <laughs> If I say you are nosy Parker, you are nosy Parker. <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> and the fact that they, you had kind of, you know, three regular you know, Indian characters on television who were involved. They weren't the butt of the joke all the time. They weren't, the, um, they weren't there to be lampooned. Uh, they weren't on the periphery of the program. They were very much a part of it was uh, incredibly kind of um, exciting and reassuring for us as British Asian viewers. And what could be nicer than a glass of pure water from the heavens above, huh? Sirf ek cheez, Ranji, aur wo hai glass of beer. <laughs> Shit up straight when you are punkering. <laughs> <laughs> Equally, it was making fun of the British Army, one of the most respected elements of our society, of this country. They may even have slipped something into the child. <laughs> so no one must drink the tea until... <laughs> you all right, Ashwood? Yes, I think so, sir. Oh, that's all right, then. You can drink the tea, Jeffs. <laughs> oh, my Godfathers! Good God, is he? I went to sit down and there wasn't a chair there. <laughs> Croft and Perry went to great lengths to make the locations look as realistic as possible. Everyone thought we um, filmed in India, but in actual fact it was uh, in Norfolk, and the desert scenes were shot in a, in a huge sand pit, which they tricked out with palms and things. And then in the, the jungle itself was woods or forests nearby, in which they imported, so they told me at the time, 500,000 pounds worth of foreign of exotic plants and planted them among the trees and it gave the impression of India. The greatest thing we've got going for us is that sweat. Everybody used to say, where did that... It was bottles of glycerin mixed with water and before every shot, it would be under the arms, over the face. Stop scratching yourself again! <laughs> I can't help it, Sergeant Major. I've got prickly heat. I'm covered in little bumps. <laughs> as far as I was concerned, Sagan, you was one big little bump. Now shut up! <laughs> Normally, First day at rehearsals, you do the line, everybody laughs. Crew, everybody laughing. <laughs> it's very funny. Second time, nobody laughs because I've seen it, except David. David would laugh, and he would laugh on every run-through, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right up to the day of transmission, he would still laugh. Though he'd seen it 20 times, he would still find it amusing, and that's very encouraging. So each time he rehearsed it, you know, this is good, this is what he wants. It's say... They are caught like rats in trap. <laughs> That's it. I knew it. We should never have come here alone. They should have sent some soldiers with us. The better the sitcom, the fewer the actual jokes. They're, they're all, I mean, it's all about the interaction of the people. The strongest material has to emanate from character. And it was the characters that Croft and Perry had themselves encountered who formed the basis for their next series. The characters in Heidi High were archetypal. The Punch and Judy man that hated kids, and I'm sure that happened. And now, your kiddies entertainer, Uncle Willie! Get out, get out, get out, of, get out of the way! <laughs> the dancers, who were just wonderful, you know, that thought themselves a cut above everybody else and used to bring their own wallpaper and pin it up. A little higher, Barry. The stalk's not quite lined up with the flower. <laughs> it's happened before, dear. It'll happen again. <laughs> so all these characters were based on real people. Everyone that David and Jimmy cast, whatever it was, they were a failure. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Heidi High. The heroism comes in the fact that they all keep going. Jeffrey can't hear you, Heidi High. <laughs> Give me strength. Most of them were never going to make anything in a million years, but you know what? They all had hope given to them. When that entertainment director comes down, could you get me an interview? You know about being a yellow coat. You did promise. But I, I said I'd try. 
He's a very busy man. Oh, please, do your best. Of course I will, Piggy. Oh, bless you. You're a lovely man. Well, thank you. <laughs> They're portrayed that life can be difficult, and it's sometimes like wading through treacle, and, and you sort of sat back and go, good, it's not just me. What happened? What happened? It was a bloody disaster. <laughs> what are you talking about? It can't have been. You see these two feet? I died on them tonight. <laughs> That's the success of their shows. That's right. It was always putting people together. Went for the underdog. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry about all this, Peggy. I'm all right. <laughs> All I remember is, you know, just waiting every week for um, Ruth to go ding, ding, ding. Hello, campers. <laughs> hi, gee, hi. Hi, hi. Oh. <laughs> what a hot day it's been. And what a lot of fun we've all had in the Olympic size swimming pool. Well, I couldn't get enough of her flirting with Simon Cattell. I mean, I'm probably thinking about uh, thinking about it. David Croft probably had a very strange effect on my learnings of romance as a boarding school girl. So I would have learnt about unrequited love from Simon Cattell and Ruth Maddock. Good morning, Jeffrey. Beautiful. <laughs> If you give out a little more, you'd be surprised what you get back in return. <laughs> that quivering, um, unfulfilled romance between Ruth Maddox's character and Simon Cadell's manager. There's so much of you that doesn't show on the surface. <laughs> a lovely, exquisitely teased out, comic, tragic romance. If only he'd take notice of her in the right way, you know, and he never did, God love him. <laughs> Croft and Perry found their own unique way of developing the storylines. We worked out this sort of technique, so we used to write it very rough, and then we'd act it. They enjoyed it because they get all their acting, bare their bits of wanting to act out of their system, didn't it, really? <laughs> We'd put it on one of those little mini recorders and just listen to it. Ted into microphone. Hello, campers. Welcome to Maplin's. Heidi, hi. That is. Go on, yellow coats. Get amongst them. Yellow coats move in amongst the campers, getting off the coat. Ted continues into the microphone. I'm Ted Bowles. If you can't hold, if you want to know anything, don't ask me. Make your way to research and sign in, and the yellow coats will help you, shall it? Hello, Mrs. Evans. Back again. Well, you see you, they did every voice. Yeah. If it was Peggy, no, oh, no, not this cat cat. <laughs> if it were Ted, Spike, what are you doing, lad? Come here. But he used to tell us sometimes in rehearsals how they did it. And I'd say, none of us sound like that. You're terrible actors. <laughs> cut to Gladys. Oh, no, not him. She hurries away. Spike sees her reaction. Spike, what's the matter? Where are you going, Gladys? He follows. Cut to Ted for more of his announcements. You back again? I thought we drowned you last year. Never mind, we'll talk like that. <laughs> they knew what they wanted to hear on that screen. They had the time of their lives writing ideas. Oh, they used to fall off the chairs <laughs> laughing. I, I received a letter from Joe Maplin this morning. I don't know about you, but I really do enjoy reading these letters because, um, <laughs> because Joe writes as he thinks and they really are sincere. Get this into your thick heads. <laughs> That's, that, 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 that's the letter, it's not me, it's the letter. This so is David Croft comedy, they are unique. They're sort of, I think it's of theatre on television, really. They're just productions, really camp, theatrical, ensemble productions that you just don't get now. Tie Gladys to the stake. Just doing that. Well, there's no need to pull it so tight. It's only pretend. It's got to be tight. Virgins have to struggle for their honour. I'm surprised you can remember that far back. <laughs> People absolutely loved, they absolutely loved the um, physical aspect of their comedy. Visual jokes are very strong vein, you know, and you can see them in Heidi High with the pantomime horse. Will you sign for this, please? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. 
Yeah. When I was given the reins of the real horse to hold, because I was in the yeah. front of the pantomime yeah. horse, this horse, it, uh, it took a shine to me, yes. and it started doing what horses do, blowing his n up nose up my nose. Oh, blimey. We'll take the shortcut along the beach. <laughs> That's what put Heidi High on the map. That scene. That's what he was so brilliant at, is that he had a, the combination of the massive laughs and this delicacy. His great thing uh, about a character, he didn't want them to be one-dimensional. I'm sorry to bother you, Mr Fairbrother. I just wanted to thank you for getting me that interview with the entertainment's director. I did ever so well. Oh, he was nice. He talked to me just like a father. He said I was to carry on trying and working hard at my job. And he'd keep a special eye on me. And later in the season, he'd let me know. I think he wanted to convey that the, certainly the characters in Heidi High, you know, they're all trying to make a better life for themselves in whichever way they knew. He managed to write characters with such, um, not only broad brushstrokes that we understood why they were funny, but such detail. Um, so he just had the right combination. I don't know how he did it. I just want you to know I'm not going to give up. I'll keep on trying and I'll be wearing that yellow coat one day. You'll see. Heidi, hi. David always wanted a reality about his work, insofar as he wanted you to be sincere. And he said, it doesn't really matter, even if you think, oh, God, this is, this is laying this on a bit thick. He said, no, if you're in that situation and you know that character well enough, that's what I want. I want you to never be afraid to, you know, bring a tear to somebody's eye. Croft and Perry weren't afraid to bring successful series to a close. But it wasn't always easy for the writers. The worst one for the last episode was Heidi High. Well, that's it, folks. It's the last night of the season. Aww. We all hope you've had a wonderful holiday. Yes. Because we've had a wonderful time entertaining you. There was a huge sadness, and I will never forget singing Goodnight Campers for the last time in the Hawaiian ballroom. I saw you in the good old farewell song. There is being sung at this very moment in Maplin's holiday camps all over the country. It was so poignant and there were real tears from us, from Sue Pollard and myself. I don't look at Pollard. <laughs> Everybody was in floods of tears because it, it was a very, very emotional ending. To yes, that it, was. it was. That was the manner of the man. He knew his job. It was a long time, and we were a great family, really. And it was just, and we just went, oh well, this is it then. You know, it was really very poignant. Oh, Ted, it's been just wonderful. I did it. I got me yellow coat. I remember this week for the rest of my life. sat there. I said, thank you, everyone. And the woman said, have we got to go now? Great moments. David and Jimmy are very hot on using people uh, from their various other sitcoms if they felt they married up. And the next series would bring together some familiar faces. You rang me, Lord.
You rang my lord was certainly our favourite of uh, the, three, oh, yeah. the three shows we did together, I think. You rang my lord. David and I think, thought it was the best. When are you going to find the £73, 7 and 6 you owe her? I've got the 7 and 6. <laughs> it certainly was David's favourite show of all. He said he thought it was part of the best of his work. What was it David said about it? It was the, the jewel in his crown? The jewel in his crown. This was given to me by my father on my 21st birthday for being a good girl. And that was given to me by the Turkish ambassador for not being a good girl. <laughs> it was very similar to Upstairs Downstairs with laughs. They were very, very interested in putting social comment underneath the comedy. I don't suppose you've been in a room like this very often? No, your lordship. Not since I've done the great this morning. <laughs> it has a lot of comment about exactly the changing of the world and how things developed majorly in the 20s and 30s. Beautiful, you're wonderful, with those shiny scrub face and those glasses with the thumbprints on them. Give over! <laughs> Teddy was great fun to play. I mean, people still come up to me and say, carbonic soup and, you know, smudgy glasses and things. And, and, uh, oh, I loved it, because it, it was outrageous, really. Why do you go in for servants? I don't know. <laughs> it just comes over me. I find myself creeping up the attic stairs, my heart pounding. Then I push open the door, and there's a smell of carbonic soup. <laughs> Well, the, the production values on your Roman law were marvellous. I mean, like a, like a feature film almost. Every piece of furniture, all the, the cut, the glasses, everything, even down to the cigars we smoked. I like the period altogether. The cloche hats and the beautiful 20s coats. And it was just, you were transported into a, another, another world. Surrounded by beautiful props and wearing lovely costumes. And all real, by the way. There was nothing fake. They had them watched 24 <laughs> hours a day with... Uh, David, you see, it cost them a fortune with props, to hire yeah. the props. Chops away! Is that right? Hold on, you man! The clever thing about all David's programmes is that they're set in the past, so that they never date. They're already, you know, in the past. And it was a historical event that inspired another hit series for David Croft and Jeremy Lloyd. Here comes that idiot Englishman who thinks he can speak our language. Crabtree, good morning. Rene, good morning. Crabtree, do you want the good nose or the bad nose? <laughs> oh, do let us have the good nose. <laughs> I have hashed up the shatting of the two tits. <laughs> what does Crabtree say of it? He has hushed up the shooting of the two tarts. You could hear them in the room going, <laughs> the laughter that was coming out of you can't say that. I think we can. Stand by for inspection by General von Klinkerhofen. Hans. General von Klinkerhofen. Colonel. General von Klinkerhofen. Michel, there is a gun in your back. If you give us away, you will be the first to die. You will do exactly as I say. Rene, and listen very carefully. <laughs> you will say it only once. <laughs> It was quite bold of David and Jeremy to put a, a, a series together called Allo Allo, set in France, occupied by the Germans. It was quite heavily criticised at the time for uh, taking the mickey out of all these brave people. David said, but we, we don't send up anyone in particular. And he said, we send up everyone. The Germans are kinky. The French are randy, and the English are stupid. Hell yeah! <laughs> the phone rang, and it was my agent, and she said, I've just been on the telephone for nearly three-quarters of an hour with, with David Croft, and he's got this idea for a new series, a new comedy series. He's eager to have you in it, Gordon, and um, he's sending the script. I started to read it. And I was laughing about a third of the way down. I thought, this is funny, and it's not one of my lines. It's just a, a description of what's going on. You know? And eventually I got through it, and I thought, I've, I've got to ring agent up and say, yes, please, with knobs on. Otto Flick, the Gestapo officer, is having dinner in the back room. 
Upstairs are two German officers in their underwear because I have borrowed their uniforms to help two British airmen to escape. The pianist over there is in fact a forger for the Marquis. And the German officer at that table fancies me. <laughs> and it is only Tuesday. You shouldn't be laughing at it because it, it breaks all the rules of political correctness, but at the end of the day, it's full of joy and delight. Is the secret camera operating correctly? I will demonstrate, Colonel. <laughs> no, I wasn't the only one in the piece that wondered if we would get away with lines like these. I have three fallen Madonnas with six pink boobies. <laughs> we were very lucky getting Gordon Kay, uh, who is from Huddersfield, who does the most marvellous French accent. I expect you would like a lie. Thank you, you're very kind. <laughs> I have no matches. <laughs> Then why do you ask me if I would like a light? I'm very sorry. <laughs> if you have no matches, if you have no matches, take mine. I have a spare box. <laughs> Are you one of them? <laughs> really, it, it was very lonely on the Russian front. Jeremy and David wrote so that you laughed out loud. You didn't just, you know, if you, even if you didn't want to laugh, you laughed. The scripts were beautiful, and we all knew where the laughs were. <laughs> uh, do you have a light? <laughs> You're light for it, just lit it. <laughs> Oh, well, I, I don't want the light. I just wondered if he had the light. I have no matches. <laughs> just giving you some matches. <laughs> These are your matches, they're not mine. <laughs> Is he one of us? No, he's one of them. Please, do not tell anybody! David had a wonderful brain for construction of shows, what was funny, uh, how to put it all together. Scripts, when they came for new series, I would read them and I'd think, oh, I can't wait for so-and-so to say that line because I knew how exactly how they would do it. And therefore David and, and Jeremy themselves obviously knew how they would do it. Listen very carefully, I shall say this only once. I beg your pardon? <laughs> It's so clever if you've got a character that people can engage in so much and uh, be interested in enough to just have quite simple catchphrases and find them so funny and want to see them every week. It is I, Leclerc. <laughs> it's only when somebody says it and it gets a laugh and then they say it again the next week and it gets a laugh, it, it then becomes a catchphrase. I think people like the knowledge that, that somebody's going to do and then, and then enjoy it when they do. You stupid woman! <laughs> the catchphrases probably that stick are the ones which, which coincide perfectly with the character in some way. Oh, <laughs> It was David's idea, which I also thought was brilliant, to have the, the English arriving not speaking French the French not understanding them, but everybody is speaking in English. Go and find us a table where we will be alone. I have a little English. I will explain. <laughs> OK, chaps, follow the boss. Oh, God, she speaks English! <laughs> the French seem to be able to understand the Germans and vice versa, but nobody understood the English. Are you expecting us by any chance? What does he say? I don't know. I don't speak English. David Croft himself used to say, D "Don't. It's a can of worms. Don't go there." You know, it's like uh, <laughs> this is this is the, these are the rules. You know, it's like don't 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 go too too deep into that. <laughs> but it's working so far. I say, is anyone down there? Oh my God! Not another stupid English man. I'll never forget David walking into the studio rehearsals one day and saying to me, I think halfway through the first series, saying to me, I've had the most brilliant idea. I've had a 
brilliant idea last night. <laughs> he said, I'm bringing in an English policeman who can't speak French. I just basically wanted to see the policeman, um, who was hilarious. Good morning. <laughs> At school. I mean, we never not said good morning. We, we just, that's what we'd say, good morning. It was just a catchphrase for us all. I was pissing by the door. <laughs> It had kind of gone to my head a bit. David came up to me and said, yes, yes, we'll do that again, and this time don't come in knowing you're going to be funny. Which is actually devastating. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> and I think it's probably the best note I've ever been given in my, my whole career. I've never forgotten it, and never will forget it. You bear a most remarkably close resemblance to René. I know. You even have the same pretty rings. Ah, uh, yes, yes, he left them to me. <laughs> now I come to look, your eyelashes are a little longer. And your hands are more artistic. <laughs> the colonel told me you arrived from Nancy this morning. Yes, he's quite right. Is yes. that where you and René were born? Yes, we were both Nancy boys. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing to, to know that I, I worked with one of the great, one of the greats of our profession. He gave something to British comedy that is like a treasure chest. They don't come like David anymore. Those sort of writers are gone, and they are I'm so sad in a way. But he's a great mentor, and you know, you couldn't want for anybody better, could you? I'm so grateful to him for all the laughs and all that he's done for the genre that I love so much. What have we got here? <laughs> Is it a mushroom? <laughs> His work was injected with a, a sense of fun, I think, as well, a, a kind of optimism. They can put 20 bombs down my trousers and they will not make me crack. <laughs> he wasn't just liked by everyone that worked with him. He was loved by everyone that worked with him. This man Croft had a knack for making people smile. Plenty of room under the arms for movement. <laughs> I get quite carried away when I put one of... <laughs> you don't argue with somebody who's got a a list of successes like he has over the years. He had a very good ear and a very good eye. Uh, I was very, very lucky to meet him. I screamed and screamed, but nobody came. We thought you were singing. <laughs> I'd like to say this as a tribute to David, because he was so easy. We never had a row. He knew it all. Can you say that about somebody? <laughs>